All right, hey, what's going on this week on What's the Story? We are uh, here with uh, Tim Quirk from Too Much Joy. So, uh, Tim, uh, my first question for you is uh, we haven't seen a new Too Much Joy album in since 96. And uh, the newest release is uh, Green A's and Crack, which is um, a re-release of your first actual LP that you put out. And uh, this one's getting, uh, like, distributed. When can we expect something new, and uh, where does this... Green Eggs and Crack come in as far as Too Much Joy? Well, Green Eggs and Crack was actually, it's about 10 years old. It was our first record. And uh, as to when you'd see a, a brand new Too Much Joy record, I don't have a clue. We've recorded a bunch of songs, and uh, I'm actually going out to New York next week to uh, do some writing with the band and, and uh, come up with some other stuff for the next record. But it would probably come out about three months after we finish it, and since we haven't started it, it could be, you know, could be six months from now, could be another year. Okay. Okay. Well, like I was saying, Green, e Green Eggs and Crack, this is uh, the new uh, re-release of Green Eggs and Crack. Um, finally not on vinyl for you, like, CD junkies. Anyway, so um, I guess my my actual real first question here for you is, uh, in the liner notes for the, for the album Green Eggs and Crack, it says that you don't want to talk about how the guys got together and how uh, and what kind of music you listen to so that's kind of my question for you now how did the guys get together and how did and what kind of music did you listen to as a kid uh well as a kid i was listening to the same stuff everyone else was aerosmith and kiss and neil diamond and you know i think that captain and Tennille was one of the first <laughs> and uh my life very literally it's the closest thing i've ever had to a religious epiphany my life literally changed the moment uh my friend Sandy dropped the needle on the very first Clash record, uh, and all of a sudden, every record I owned up until that point just suddenly seemed like what it actually was, and <laughs> I just hadn't realized, which was just a bunch of posturing crap. And uh, the second I heard Clash City Records, it was, you know, it just resonated. It sounded like that's what music was supposed to be. And uh, Sandy and I were, you know, we used to listen to it all the time and go to little high school dances and complain that all these rich kids with guitars and synthesizers were trying to play Stairway to Heaven and, <laughs> and we'd be, we just said, you know, these Clash songs sound like they're a lot easier to play and these dances would be a lot funner if some band was doing it. So we kind of looked at each other and said, well, gosh, they can't be that hard to learn. So we took lessons. All right. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump around through the years here with my questions. My next question is, um, how did the, uh, the friendship with uh, Weird Al come about? Um, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, we, we have a couple of celebrity friends, and unfortunately none of them are supermodels. They're all comedians. <laughs> uh, I don't know why comedians gravitate toward too much joy. It's, um, I guess, because we don't take ourselves all that seriously. But uh, apparently he was a fan, and sometimes when he was on MTV doing his Al TV, he played Too Much Joy videos, and, you know, we'd get little royalty checks because of it. So we had lots of reasons to like him. I don't <laughs> know why he liked us. But uh, we were playing the whiskey one time, and he was right up front mouthing all the words. It was very disconcerting. <laughs> so uh, Jay finally got fed up and just pulled him up on stage. So do you want to tell us what uh, what was the rest of that night? What happened the rest oh, of that night? the rest of that night. Well, basically <laughs> what happened was everyone... You know, I stand in the middle of the crowd, in the middle of the stage, and I'm used to having everyone in the audience stare at me, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden, Weird Al jumped on stage and put his leg behind his head, and you could just see the entire audience go like this. <laughs> and, you know, if you, if, you, if you have enough of an ego to want to be the front man in a band in the first place, that's the type of thing that sort of pisses you off. And yeah, I was a little drunk, and I was just sitting there going, gosh, everyone's looking at Weird Al. I want everyone to look at me. How can I make them look at me? And I don't know, the first thing that occurred to me was maybe if I took off all my clothes, everyone would look at me. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> all right. Um, so, the, back to the, uh, the re-release here, uh, Green Eggs and Crack. Uh, how do you feel that uh, your, your writing style has changed from the time you were 18 and recording uh, Green Eggs and Crack? Uh, Green Eggs and Crack? Bad. <laughs> afterwards, good. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, well, when you first started writing Green Green Eggs and Crack, it was just the two two people, right? That were writing everything. Yeah, or? It was it was Sandy J and I. Okay. And, uh, we went through a bunch of drummers, and for some reason, all our drummers have always been named Tommy. Tommy. Okay. Uh, and Tommy Tommy Vinton, who ended up drumming on most of the tracks on Green Eggs and Crack, then he went away, he joined a heavy metal band for a couple of years, and we toured with different Tommies, and then he came back by the time we got a recording contract. Okay, and do you feel that the the new 
um, or the new re-release represents too much joy is kind of where they are now, or are you just saying? No, it's, it's where we it's it's where okay. we were, and it was where we were was so embarrassing that we couldn't help but throw on a couple of more recent songs just to say <laughs> we we eventually learned how to play these things. Okay, um, and as I'm listening to uh, Green Eggs and Crack, I'm noticing a lot of uh, possible early '80s Athens influences. Oh, God, yeah. And um, so, did you like really dig like Pylon? Or 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 REM or B52s it was, it or, or what were you into at the time? It was mostly it was mostly REM. It, I mean, <coughs> we formed the band to basically to play Clash songs at uh, mm-hmm. at high school dances, which we did. And then nobody, nobody, we, we <laughs> it was a grand plan. But what we didn't realize was we were the only people in the high school who bought the Clash records. So when we were playing <laughs> these songs, no one had any idea what we were doing. Well, they all have it now. Yeah, yeah. Well, but back then, you know, this is 1980, 1979, 1980, and. Uh, we finally realized if no one knew what we were playing, we might as well try writing our own songs. Yeah. And so we, you know, we wrote a bunch of originals, and then we also love Gang of Four, and we went to see yeah. we went to see Gang of Four uh, at a club called the Left Bank in Mount Vernon, and there was maybe like 30 people in the audience, and this opening band came on. We were all set to boo them because that's what you did back then, <laughs> and then all of a sudden we realized these guys were amazing. And they weren't just amazing; they were like they were transcendent. They were just fantastic, and they weren't just transcendent and fantastic. They were everything we were trying to be, and they mm-hmm. were doing everything that we thought we wanted to do. And they were called REM. They had all they had out was the hip tone single of Radio Free Europe at that point, and uh, so we followed them. Uh, I remember Jay and I went into the city the next day. We went to Bleecker Bob's and they had this single, but it was five dollars. We're talking nineteen nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty dollars here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I was like, "There's no way I'm paying five dollars for a single." And Jay said, "No, this is going to be worth a lot of money one day." And he bought it. He's right. He still has it. It's one of his prized possessions. Uh, so yeah, we were we were big REM wannabes at the time. Did you get a chance to play with them at all ever? Or? No, we just no? we just would go backstage and pester them all the time. <laughs> the tapes and go, oh, "We're in a band just like yours, man." <laughs> okay. Um, and another thing about. Uh, um, the Screen Eggs and Crack release that I noticed is uh, that I understood all the songs that are on here and uh, like they're all really cool to me except with one exception and that is the Otter song and I want to know what's the deal with that song I mean was this a song that you wrote and said I have to do this song and the guy said we don't want to be on that song do it yourself or was it a poem or how did it come about well the Otter song it, it was actually written around here in San- it was written at the San Francisco Zoo and uh, I was going to I was going to college out here, and my girlfriend at the time loved zoos. So any city we were in, we had to go to the zoo. Uh, and I, I'm not a big zoo fan. So we get to this one little exhibit, and uh, it's just this. It's literally a cement pit. It's just a hole in the ground, uh, and there's a garden hose in there, and it's spitting out this brown stream of water. And then there's this concrete island in the middle. And I was looking down, and I go, God, what poor creature has this miserable existence? Who has to live in this crappy environment? And just literally right as I had that thought, this little otter poked his head out of the wooden cabin, and he he jumped into the stream of water. And then his little otter friend came out. And they just started frolicking and playing. They looked like they were having the time of their lives, and they had no idea they were living in squalor. And it seemed there was something <laughs> admirable about it. So I just started, you know, making up these little couplets and singing them to amuse myself while we were looking at the white tigers and the wallabies and and the capybaras and all the other crappy animals. <laughs> I was just singing. I hated all the other animals in the zoo except the otters. And then um, I went back to New York, and we were recording a couple of the songs for Green Eggs and Crack. And you know, it was one in the morning. We had some tape left over, and and a few was, beers, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I said, oh, keep it running, Al. I want to try this thing. I just kind of winged it. Okay. Okay. And um, <clears throat> who came up with the uh, ever famous and always recognizable uh, "Too Much Joy" uh, logo? The hand with the. That was uh, an, an incredible artist named Jody Stringham, who was working on a Mutiny album, and uh, we'd been we'd been trying to. And every time we had a new record, you know, we'd have the artist, whatever artist was doing the cover, we'd say, oh, we need a Too Much Joy logo, come up with something. And we had a sort of like a Batman one on Serial Killers, and then there was this sort of, uh, these pastel razor blades off of Serial Killers that were okay, but and it was, had this Too Much Joy in this evil 70s font, it was no good. <laughs> uh, but once we got the firecracker, we're like, that's it, that's perfect. Because, you know, it's vaguely revolutionary, but it's really just a firecracker. It's yeah. Kind of like us. <laughs> All right. And, um... <clears throat> Let's see. Um, what brought about your move here to California? I mean, leaving the other guys behind. Well, yeah, this is a really awesome house. But um, what brought about like you saying, okay, guys, I got to move to California. You guys stay here in New York. And um, my wife and I met my wife out here, and uh, we'd always planned on moving back to mm-hmm. San Francisco. Um, 
and we were in we were living in Manhattan, you know, in teeny tiny little shoebox apartments uh, for seven years. And every year, I would say, look, you, next by this time next year, either we're going to have a hit single and we'll be rich enough to live wherever we want, or the band will break up. Uh, and after saying that every year for seven years, I finally realized we were never going to be filthy rich and we were never going to break up. So we might as well just move <laughs> and let the band deal with it. Okay. Okay. And um, I want to know, uh, did uh, another uh, cable access guy similar to myself actually really break one of your guitars? Oh, well, he was he was a, he was a little bit more than public access. Oh, okay. It was, it was still on a crappy cable show. It was on, remember that network America's Talking? I have no idea. Well, no, it was this. It, it it went under. It was a division <laughs> of MS of uh, CNBC. Uh, it was it was all talk shows all the time. And one day we went on one of the programs, and the host, who was this, I mean, he was literally he was cr- cloned in the in the TV host factory. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, he had the shellacked hair and the perfect teeth and the insincere laugh. And he looked just like Brian Gumbel, or a lot like that. <laughs> scary. And uh, he came over. He came over at the end of our song, and you know we'd done our standard little thing of you know whatever happens when we play we tend to go into these fugue states and black out i guess i dropped my guitar at the end of it and he came he comes over he goes oh i always wanted to do that can i do that and i'm like yeah sure so he picked up the guitar and he he hurled it he had no idea i'm a professional i know how to make (laughs) it look like being destructive but you know you got to pick it up and play it again the next night and he just smashed it like broke the neck of it off or or? the neck but he put out he put out it was a it was an ovation electric acoustic and he put a hole in the body which was irrep it was not repairable yeah ruined but it was great i i got a you know a new thousand dollar guitar out of well the that's deal. cool that's a good deal yeah all right and um so i was reading your uh, bio last night and uh i saw that you guys were actually in a salt and pepper video and i want to know how did that happen and uh, are you good friends with them too uh, that, was, that was back in our rap phase we were uh no basically what happened was our publicist at the time you know we'd had we'd had ll cool j and we covered an ll cool j song he was in our video and you know, KRS One was on one of our songs, and you know, we sort of knew some of these people mostly through the publicist we had at the time. And I don't know whose bright idea it was, but ABC was doing this "Let's Talk About AIDS" special, mm-hmm. and uh, Peter Jennings had apparently heard Salt and Pepper's song "Let's Talk About Sex," and he thought it was very direct. So, and and just what he needed to communicate with the kids of America. So he had <laughs> them sort of re-recorded as "Let's Talk About AIDS," and then a whole cross section of of stars of rap and rock. Uh, got together to be in this video, including uh, yourself. And, well, we were the rock people, <laughs> and uh, and I think Dave Kendall from MTV, if you remember him, <laughs> he was, yeah, he was the other white guy in it. He had like this hair thing. Yeah. Oh wait, no, no, no. Dave Kendall, the guy from uh, 120 Minutes. Yeah. Okay, that guy. Yeah, he was cool. <laughs> and uh, we, it was, it was actually, it was humiliating because what they they had everyone like spray paint words on this big white sheet, like like uh, you know, silence equals death was one of them and, <laughs> and uh, you know equality and condoms and every, our, we were supposed to write the word equals mm-hmm. and all these other people you know they had spray painting skills and so I start <laughs> you know the band's all just standing there kind of going like this you know while I'm, and I get to I get to spray paint with the can and uh, I make my E and my E's really big and then I make my Q and I realize as I'm in the middle of the queue that I'm going to run out of room before I get to the S. <laughs> okay. So I start with a big E, a big Q, and then a little U, and then all the letters get smaller and smaller, <laughs> and then I just had to put the L and the S on the bottom. <laughs> and it was horrifying because there were like 10 or 15 rap stars just cracking up while I'm doing it. <laughs> just, they were just in awe of my pathesis. It was, it was a humiliating moment, and thank you for making me realize Oh, okay, that. sorry. <laughs> all right, so you guys did... Um, the title track to one of my all-time favorite clown movies ever, and that would be uh, Shakes the Clown. And I want to know, did how many clown movies are there? Um, Shakes the Clown. Okay. Um, and I want to know, did you guys like get to hang out with like Adam Sandler and Florence Henderson? <laughs> oh. No, but we did. Again, we got to hang out with Bob Gat Goldblum okay. because comedians love too much joy. It's, we're apparently in the wrong line of business. Uh, but no, Bob was great, and he uh, he was gonna direct the Crush Story video, um, but then we ended up going with the guy who did a uh, Warren's Cherry Pie. Oh, I'm sorry. Also, well, no, he'd also done he'd also done the Who movie, The Kids Are All okay. Right, which I All loved. Right. Uh, and so we wanted. We told him we wanted a cross between the kids are all right and cherry pie. So we had we had sexy models and bikinis and stuff. Uh, but no, we had nothing to do with the filming of the movie itself. The song had been written, you know, and released long before that. Mm. 
Bob Goldthwait had apparently liked it and thought it would fit, so it got to run over the end credits. We did get to go to the premiere, though. That's cool. That's a cool. little party at, at, at the bar bat afterwards. So you didn't get to hang out with Florence Henderson at all? Uh, she might have been at the party, but honestly, I, my wife and I had like two free drinks and... And took off. Bolted. All right. All right. And so you guys, um, now this is kind of my last question for you, and you can tell me whatever you want after this, but uh, my last question is, uh, you guys have jumped around a bit from... Uh, from your own first label, which was uh, uh, Stone Garden, to Alias, to Giant, to Discovery, and now to Sugar Fix. And I want to know, uh, what made you uh, decide to put out Green Eggs and Crack with Sugar Fix? Um, well, we've been thinking about doing it ourselves for the longest time, uh, and we always stopped just because it's a logistical nightmare. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a pain in the ass, and someone else was willing to do it and deal with all the headaches, so... They get a cut of it, basically. Okay. And so, right now, I want you to tell me whatever else you want me to tell you, or want you to tell us. Uh, I have nothing to say. Nothing? You would be, you would, you would be amazed how many people ask that as the last <laughs> really? question. Okay. I think it's just a generic thing that everybody says, and yeah. then cut out of the interview after, anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I just want to say um, thank you very much to uh, Tim Quirk from Too Much Joy, and uh, right now we're going to see a Too Much Joy video, and oh, so I'm going to put you on the spot and say which video do you want to see. Um, well, That's a Lie is probably the only one that's really any good. Okay. All right, so here comes that, and uh, stick around. Later. <laughs>